Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 33 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James, and first of all, I got a haircut today, a little summer haircut. I was worried that because of the hot weather, it's a little bit chilly here in Nova Scotia now, but I thought that maybe because of the hot weather, you know, my hair was going to get a little bit too long, so I thought maybe I'd cut it. So it's still, well, I got it trimmed from the head shop, so still a little long, but, uh, you know, a little shorter than it was. So moving on from another topic besides my hair, which no one seems to really give a crap about, today on Nostalgia Talk, I have with me the one and only Greg Berg. Thanks for coming. Well, hello there. How's it? How was your day today? Today is doing good. I'm uh, picking up all my uh, uh, future work for next week, so it's uh, keeping me busy. That's great. That's what I usually do. I uh, plan everything uh, usually a day ahead, uh, a couple of days ahead. Oh. Do it ahead of time. Nice. Now, for any of you listeners out there who don't know who Greg Berg is, he is a voice actor who's done lots of work in TV and film. He did Baby Fozzie and Baby Scooter in Muppet Babies. Uh, he was in Garfield and Friends. He did Donatello in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, he did Huckleberry Hound in Yo Yogi. He's done lots of work in film and also has done uh, voice matching for various Hollywood actors. So it's so it's a pleasure to have someone with such an incredible career on the show. Welcome. Well, it's great being here. Looking oh. forward to this. All right. Well, then let's get right down to business. So, uh, in turn, so let, let's go uh, back in time a little bit. You know, once upon a time, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, when it, <laughs> I was I was being facetious. Um, when it comes to uh, voiceover, was it animation that had an influence on you, or was it radio that had an influence on you? Well, I watched cartoons so. Uh, in my early days, uh, first before radio. So, and then uh, uh, that uh, I related to the animation from TV and then radio through the radio. And uh, so there were different entities to deal with uh, when growing up. My family used to listen to the radio a lot, or my dad did, and then my mother always watched TV. But uh, there I was watching cartoons on TV and uh, was influenced from watching the cartoons, not really thinking one day I want to do that until I saw Mel Blanc uh, being interviewed. And he even said something to the effect of, isn't this great to be uh, older? And uh, this is what I do for a living doing silly voices. And I said, me, hey, I might like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your very first ever voice acting role in the media? I would say for when I wasn't a professional actor in Hollywood and when I was growing up in Akron, Ohio, I used to listen to the radio and there was a, a bit of a comedy routine going on in the morning show. And so I, I called up as a listener in the voice of like a, a like a young gangster and <laughs> the... Uh, uh, host thought it was funny and interviewed me uh, just for what was going on in the world. But I, I was basically calling in to uh, drop a joke to him. Like I uh, called myself Louie and I said, hey, this is Louie. And he goes, hey, what are you doing this morning, Louie? I said, oh, I'm uh, listening to the show. And then and then I, I would tell like a joke. I said, like, what do you call a, 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 or I have a definition of what a disc jockey is. He goes, oh yeah, what's that? I said, it's a, a fellow that makes a lot of chatter about a platter that doesn't matter. And then uh, he'd go and laugh and then go into his next song. And uh, I call up each week with some, some little routine like that. That's funny. Um, and then eventually uh, one of your first big roles, or at least from what I, from what I know, maybe I'm wrong, but one of your first big roles was uh, as Baby Fozzie and Baby Scooter in Muppet Babies. Actually, there was a, uh, I joined the Professional Actors Union in early 80s. So before Muppet Babies, Muppet Babies came out in 84. I uh, was doing uh, a pilot for a series uh, called Robot Man and Friends in 1982. And oh. uh, that was based on a comic strip that they were animating and uh, uh, they gave it a test to see if it can eventually turn into a, a show. So uh, that was really my very first uh, professional voice work uh, on camera, or not on camera, but uh, as an uh, animation voice. 
prior to that, I was doing radio plays that there was an organization that ran uh, old time radio plays with a theme of uh, some religious content of, uh, you know, it's not good to steal or whatever uh, lesson they were trying to teach for the week. So they would perform, um, I, I believe it was a half hour, and they put it onto records and send it to different radio stations that subscribed, and I would be involved on uh, uh, that type of project. It was sponsored by the Salvation Army, so it, was, it had, a, had a strong back, backing with it. So that came up to do voice work in itself. And then after that, uh, I was actually coming to Hollywood to do comedy character acting. And I wanted to be on shows like the Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, Happy Days, that kind of thing. I, I studied with a guy who was a fantastic trainer, uh, Harvey Lembeck from some older uh, well-known movies uh, as I was growing up. And I figured he's the guy that can set, send me on my way to that area. Well, after about, after we got primed to be really good at it, the students in these workshops, he had people from Robin Williams to John Ritter and some of the Happy Days people that he was training in comedy. And uh, so right when I was about primed to go out and try to accomplish some of these roles, uh, all those shows were canceled. <laughs> so I was stuck to say, what do I do with these characters I can do? And somebody mentioned, why not do them for animation or commercials? So I went looking how to do that and uh, found these various uh, outlets that needed that kind of uh, talent. That's interesting. Wow. So when you did uh, Muppet Babies, um, you know, it's it, it, it's obviously very different from like the Muppets series because, you know, it's they're, they're puppets, of course. I've interviewed tons of people at Muppets before uh, who are puppeteers. Uh, and, I, and I recently spoke with Katie Lee, who is also in Muppet Babies. All right. Yeah. And um, so when you did Fozzie and Scooter, did you get any advice from the uh, Muppet performers on how to play the characters? I uh, was given all directions through the director who uh, ordered various uh, clips of the characters uh, to show me and say, this is the vibe we were going for. And uh, I remember reading for Fozzie and most likely Scooter. And um, then when I got the call that said, okay, you're going to be Fozzie and Scooter. I was really thrilled. And uh, because I understood the characters, uh, the, the deal was that they wanted them to be baby versions of those characters. So apparently I gave them what they were looking for and booked both of those roles. Nice. So were you a Muppet fan before doing Muppet Babies? I, I certainly was. I uh, had watched everything from the Muppets on uh, the Ed Sullivan show where they uh, did a lot of performing and then uh, eventually Sesame Street came out and uh, I was into Sesame Street and the electric company because uh, there were some odd shows uh, rather than typical cartoons and was happy it was, see we were only able to pick those up on uh, UHF <laughs> channels back in the day and uh so after watching them i said i want to do that too and i even contacted children's television workshop to find out how i can be some voices of some of their animated cartoons or any anything with a voice and uh, they uh took my letter and gave me just like a uh, good luck at uh, pursuing it and you know you got to be in New York more or less and uh, and that but th that was the beginning seeds of uh, me pursuing doing this and I was beyond thrilled <laughs> I don't know how uh, incredibly thrilled uh, when I got to work with anything associated with Jim Henson. Mm. Now did you get to know Jim Henson very well? Uh, Jim was on the East Coast most of the time. He did come up to a couple of the recordings in uh, Los Angeles when time permitted, and he didn't even give us notes. He, I guess all the notes I heard 
he would give to the director, which weren't very many to say, uh, he more or less probably just saying you're right on track with this, so keep up the good work and all. But we did get to meet him. I was very fortunate to get a picture with him uh, and the rest of the cast uh, when somebody brought a camera, luckily. Mm -hmm. Back then they didn't have the cell phones with the cameras or all. But uh, so we, I met him in that way, just to say hi. I actually, uh, before the show even started, I was in Beverly Hills doing a, an errand uh, that wasn't even, I wasn't really supposed to even be in that area that day, but I, I happened to be running an errand. I'm walking across the middle of the street and uh, I run into Frank Oz. Oh, nice. Why would he even be there? So it was just kismet. Everything came together. I, I, I just saw him in passing and I just go, are you Frank Oz? He went, yeah. I said, uh, <laughs> I got to talk to you for a second. And so I talked to him on the corner of the uh, street as the cars are rushing by and all that. It was like a strange place to just to talk to somebody. So, yeah, and I told him who I was. I'm going to be doing a young version of his voices for the animation show and all. And uh, eventually, once I did write to him when he was in the middle of uh, uh, filming a uh, movie, but I needed some advice from him and then. I got the letter that he wrote back uh, telling me, you know, if I do these characters, do them for Jim's company so I don't get into any uh, legal battles. Because you know? okay. sometimes people would say, hey, we want to put a uh, posse in our, our show and can you come in and do this? I'm like, you got to ask the handsome people. So, okay. You know, that's encounters with both. So, uh, did you? Uh, so obviously, you met Frank Oz uh, and got you know some pointers of doing Fozzie. Did Richard Hunt give you any advice on doing Scooter? Never met Richard. Okay. Uh, they once had, uh, I guess, the very first Muppet convention in Los Angeles about the year two thousand, and I popped in to uh, see what it was about. So they brought. Uh, about 10 of the uh, puppeteers there uh, and uh, Jerry Nelson was there and uh, uh, Brian Henson. So uh, that was the group at that point. Um, uh, and they answered questions from the audience and all, but uh, uh, I, I even met Bill Beretta uh, in passing because he was part of uh, the Muppets at that time too. Mm. Bill, Bill is a very, very funny guy. Yeah, yeah. So just getting the opportunity to meet the people from the East Coast where I did, uh, that was another encounter with them. Mm. Cool. Uh, do you have a favorite Muppet character, either one that you did on Muppet Babies or just or or just a, any generic Muppet at all? Well, if I pick them up, I, I just enjoy, I, I love Jerry Nelson's work when he's saying uh, halfway down the stairs and eventually I think they gave it to one of the other Muppets to sing as well that is most noted for doing that particular song. But uh, I saw the one of the characters that Jerry Nelson did, and that was kind of what I was trying to do with Scooter. And, okay. But, uh, you know, these are names that a lot of people probably don't recognize, but the characters, uh, uh, I don't even know what the character's name was. That the one that did Halfway Down the Stairs? Yeah. It was Robin. That, well, see, now, the one I saw wasn't the frog. It was a, oh. a, a yeah, human type Muppet. Oh. Uh, yeah, scooter-looking scooter, scooter -looking Muppet. <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll Google it, and I'll let you know. Yeah, because once I saw that, I said, yeah, that's kind of the sweetness of the uh, singing that he did for it. Uh, mm. Went to my liking what he does. Did you ever hear uh, Jerry Nelson's album that he recorded? It's pretty good. No, never did. Uh, I'm still finding uh, somebody sent me uh, uh, how they recorded or took pictures of the Muppet Babies live show. <laughs> and I know we we went to one of the performances of that, but somebody actually has a collection of pictures from it and their memories. of. I think afterwards they got to shake hands with each of the characters and that kind of thing. So that was new to hear. <laughs> cool. Um 
when I had Katie Lee on here, uh, I, I talked to her about a, a voice artist who's quite well known and unfortunately is not with us anymore. I've actually got a couple of uh, questions here about some voice actors that aren't with us anymore. Uh, but one of them I want to talk about is somebody that was uh, on Muppet Babies. I think I think she did Baby Gonzo. Do you have any memories of Rusi Taylor? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I guess after doing a hundred some episodes with her, uh, always bright and sunny, uh, never complaining. If there was anything that came up, we'd all have a good laugh about it. Uh, it, it would say like, well, why are they doing this? It sounds like this, but it, it would just be <laughs> uh, a very offhand remark that's funny. But uh, uh, I've never had any complaints with anybody. Uh, and I don't have any complaints with anybody in the voiceover business. I can't remember uh, even that when people say, oh, is there anybody you don't like working with? Said, no, we're, this is a great family of people to be part of. But Rusi uh, was very, uh, just a big ray of sunshine to the group. And mm. uh, you could hear it with the character because <laughs> she was silly just like that. Uh, you know, if, if Gonzo had to say something with a stuffed nose or something, she'd grab her nose and just tweak it. And it <laughs> here we are watching her make the performance uh, that way. And then uh, she went on also to do Minnie Mouse's voice. And, right strawberry shortcake she had done earlier mm. so uh, you can tell from her collection of uh, voices just what type of person she was that's that's happened to me in the past where people were saying hey can you do this uh, gruff character that's you know spitting foul language here and there and I said no I'm a, a nice guy I'm that's you know I'm an actor but uh, uh, it depends what the context is. If this is a, a, a meaty character, yeah, but just to do a character like that and just to get a laugh out of it or something, but no, I, I don't do that. And if you look at all the people who worked on Muppets, I don't see anybody that veered from that style of cartoons. Mm. Uh, just like when I do uh, appearances at conventions, uh, I with the body of work I've done, m m my characters are cute and cuddly. So at conventions, you're mostly getting the uh, action figures and the uh, superheroes. So uh, luckily I did uh, voices on Ninja Turtles that helped me get into some of those conventions. But it's been rare to find a convention that is just all family oriented. Uh, it's mostly these conventions these days are for the action figures and the superhero mm. but uh, that, that's kind of my my body uh, of characters I do so I, I remember trying to read for some tough uh, characters in my early days maybe 20 years ago and I kept getting directions from the director he says be meaner do this and I said well I'll try and and uh, over the years I still uh, come off sounding too nice they say <laughs> So, well, that's me. <laughs> well, nothing wrong with that, honestly. No, it, it was just a comment I'm making because some people say, do I do conventions? And they've always wondered about that. And I said, uh, whichever ones would bring me out uh, because, you know, it's a matter of the audience that would be there. And most of them were there to say, hey, do, you know, uh, all the, the you know Krang and all that other kind of thing uh, from the Ninja Turtles the, and, and Skeletor and all those things. And uh, mine are uh, Ozzy and Scooter and uh, uh, Donatello from Ninja Turtles. And, uh, it's funny you mentioned Krang because uh, Pat Fraley came on this show uh, back when it started in the fall. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's a good guy. Great oh, guy. yeah. He's, yeah, he's very funny. He's a very funny man as well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've we, we've never had like a, a get together, you know, but we all know each other more or less. The, um, the small group of us that had some outstanding characters, uh, and uh, we're just one big happy voiceover family. That's wonderful. Um, so I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Garfield and Friends, which um, I've uh, watched occasionally. And uh, <laughs> something else I'll actually point out is that um, for the listeners. Greg Berg is not to be confused with Greg Berger, who also was in a lot of 
some of these productions. Like he was in Garfield and Friends as Orson, I think, uh, a, a different voice actor that I'm that I'm talking to. But maybe one of these days I'll talk to Greg Berger. One of these days, Greg Berg voiced. Um, I think it was the judge in Garfield and Friends. Um, I was in a few episodes, and my most popular one was where uh, Garfield, I guess, built a refrigerator that uh, was a robotic refrigerator that had different uh, voices coming out of it, (laughs) uh, depending on the situation. So I knew the writer and the writer knew some of my work uh, that I did voice impressions and all. So we went through a list of some that I did that were current and that would fit the show. And I wound up uh, being like uh, Sam Kinison and Bobcat Goldthwait and David (laughs) Brenner. And uh, so like uh, a clean version of Sam, I guess it was just the screen part. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I'm trying to think I, I, since this happened many years ago, but I'm like uh, Bob Gagalsway was like, um, um, don't you hate it when people uh, want to get food out of their insides? <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then it would turn into, uh, David Brenner saying something. Uh, some of these n- names right now probably are re- relevant to some people, but uh, if the audience is 40 and over, they'd know the characters, but I'm constantly coming up with new voices as well, so the younger people can relate to as well. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, that, that's one of the ma- major roles on the Garfield show. Uh, yeah, Greg Berger, as you brought up, uh, I do get fan mail from people thinking uh, that I'm Greg Berger, which I have to uh, point out, uh, he has two G's at the uh, right. <laughs> but he also did. Uh, he's a lower range, and uh, carried off uh, things on Duck. Uh, um, well, it, uh, the uh, the other parts uh, he did was uh, GI Joe and right. uh, Transformers. That's uh, Grimlock, yes. Yeah, so he's in that range of being able to do those type of characters and be rough and tough and all that. (laughs) Right. Uh, We get to both work on Garfield, though. uh, Speaking of uh, voice actors that uh, have uh, worked on many different shows, as I was doing my research for this, I uh, was looking up uh, Garfield and Friends. I've watched it before. uh, It's a little bit before my time, but it's a funny show. And... um, I uh, was reading the list of voice actors who were on it and under various characters, there was one voice actor that I was wondering about. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, did you ever intera- have inter- any interaction with Paul Winchell? Did you get to know Paul- him at all? I never did. Uh, I, I met his daughter who was doing a, a commercial at one point, a radio commercial, and I think either she wrote it or else we were just both in it together. And uh, from time to time, if I see she's in town, I think she lives in Las Vegas, but from time to time, I oh. might give her a note to say, hey, uh, remember me? Or She probably knew me because she did radio. And at one point, I was uh, not hired by the station itself, but I was doing voices on the ever popular Rick Dees in the Morning radio show and Rick Dees Weekly Top 40. Mm. And that was something where Rick's wife was a cartoon voice person as well. So somehow we gelled together and uh, he needed voices for his show. And I said, I'm available and I did what I did. And he said, yeah, keep calling in if you can. And so on his particular show for people who listened to Rick Dees or followed him, I was the voice of a character called John Revolting. <laughs> And he was, uh, of course, based on Vinnie Barbarino type uh, John Travolta character. And we at first called him John Travolta. Hey, John Travolta's calling in and all that. And basically, I would say, hey, you know, I just was listening to the show and uh, it's the, the best show I ever heard on radio. And that kind of thing where I'd call in and he'd say, okay, so what are you doing lately, John? And then I'd say something like, well, last night I was kind of bummed out because I was, uh, we played Scrabble and I found out I didn't know how to spell. So then we played Trivial Pursuit. And then I found out I don't know anything. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and 
you know, laugh bits or whatever. But uh, yeah, so we did that for like 20 years together. And I did some appearances with him uh, because I also, uh, as I say, did comedy acting work. And I uh, worked at the comedy store in a comedy group with Bill Hicks and two other comics. And uh, so all that, you know, built up to me getting, I guess, Fozzie Bear as my more popular character because uh, he was the comic bear. But uh, yeah, so many little components added up to this. And I'm so grateful for everything that I uh, was part of. And uh, so yeah, doing these voices uh, and getting back to knowing Paul Winchell. I'd never met Paul, uh, but uh, I've worked with Don Messick, who was also at one time a ventriloquist. Oh. And, uh, Dawes Butler, who was a ventriloquist. I was course. actually, that, that was one of the questions I had in here, if you got to know Dawes Butler. I uh, studied with him one-on-one, -on -one. yeah. Uh, oh. And it was probably early in my uh, professional career because uh, I needed, I wanted to get that uh, a professional uh, direction from him. And so we worked one-on-one -on -one for a while, and, uh, you know, and I didn't do his main workshops with some of the people and Nancy Cartwright eventually uh, <laughs> blew into superstardom from it. And uh, so I studied with Dawes. I studied with Ralph James, who is the voice of uh, Orson and Mork and Mindy. Oh, so nice. I, I got a lot of uh, helpful hands to help get me where I was. And for any of the listeners who don't know who Dawes Butler is, uh, Dawes was the voice of Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound for Hanna-Barbera. And if you don't know who uh, Paul Winchell was, he was uh, a ventriloquist, a very funny ventriloquist. Uh, uh, to, any, to, to you listeners out there, look up on YouTube, Knucklehead Gets Fired by Paul Winchell. It's hilarious. So he was a ventriloquist, and he also was the original voice for Tigger and Gargamel. And as Noel McNeil was uh, saying... Uh, Paul Winchell also invented the artificial heart. And that's well, quite the I, accomplishment. I, yeah. I, I believe it was, yeah, the early uh, version of it or some components to it. And I guess they give him the, the main credit for it. But mm. yeah, I, I always wondered about that too, uh, to know that he did that. But you never know what everybody in this business is uh, uh, made of, uh, whatever happened. Uh, with what they're doing because like some people when i tell them i do comedy acting they're like oh i thought you were a voice person and some people that uh find that out later and they say we need a voice guy and they think well greg's a comedy actor <laughs> so i'm like wait a minute I, mean, I do a little bit of both and now that uh, you know you've seen robin williams go through being a serious actor and then being a comedic actor uh, gotta keep open-minded i say but Again, we're, I guess your show right now is addressing uh, the fans of cartoons and uh, hopefully. It's, it's really uh, an eclectic yeah. kind of show. Like it's, uh, I've had people who have done multiple projects from uh, 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 like multiple retro TV film projects or even books. Like I had Jim Benton on here, who was the author of the Dear Dumb Diary books, which is a book series that my friends and I loved when we were in elementary school. That's great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, ho so hopefully, a lot of you listeners are enjoying, you know, all of the all of this incredible group of people, and uh, very happy to add Greg Berg to the list. Well, now that they know, uh, hearing me speak and all, because again, uh, most people get to hear me at uh, maybe doing a panel at uh, some of these cons that uh, are able to put together a panel for whatever reason we did a, a Muppet baby reunion semi reunion uh, about a year ago in uh, Reno. Oh, and nice. Katie Lee, myself and Lori O'Brien was there. Oh, and cool. Took answers uh, to the questions that people had. Uh, mm. you know, so we're, we're, we're around and uh, uh, some are busier than others, but we're uh, still doing it. <laughs> right. So, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, uh, that's why I say I, I'm thinking of the audience that are listening right now. Uh, if they like hearing this or whatever they want to hear, that's why I'll let you uh, run the show here. Uh, there's so many ways we can go with this, but uh, you know, whatever you had intend, intended to do, uh, uh, 
with it. Because okay. I don't want to be too boring and saying, oh, and then I did this and that. I'm telling you answers to questions you probably had that uh, people might be interested in. Oh, feel free to share whatever stories you want. Yeah. Well. Uh, uh, so uh, next question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, doing Donatello on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Well, that's pretty interesting. Donatello, the original, is done by Barry Gordon. And uh, at one time, it was people were asking why. So I'm probably answering questions uh, people also probably would have had. Uh, they asked, why did they replace him with me uh, temporarily? Well, at that particular time, uh, he became the president of the Screen Actors Guild, which oh. uh, required him to go to meetings and appearances for uh, causes going on and uh, they were in the middle of recording the Ninja Turtles and they said well we've got to find somebody to replace his voice temporarily but they're not going to write him out uh, but who knew how long he was going to be out and something worked out uh, so yeah I did uh, his voice is more like this or as, as I gave it to them I said this is kind of what I thought he sounded like and uh, so I, I went in there and uh, got the part, and they said, "Oh, by the way, he also did Bebop." Well, Bebop is a whole other character, and uh, we gotta get more of go. And so I was able to cover that, so uh, fit in uh, for what they needed. And I guess further down the line, some of the other turtles uh, weren't able to appear, and they had other alternatives as well. So I don't know how many uh, shows they've done, but I did about six or seven shows uh, for the meantime. Which, okay. uh, yeah. Well, Barry Gordon's interesting because he also did a voice in a commercial as the quick, Missley quick bunny. Really? And that was him. Wow. Yeah. I, rem I remember those ads. I, I remember being called in to, to uh, I don't know whether there's a negotiation thing going on or a new character of the rabbit coming up and whatever was happening but i i was just sent on an audition for that they said here's the voice and it was barry gordon's voice i was like yeah i do kind of his voice <laughs> and uh, so at least they were probably gonna consider me but uh, I, again down the line when he definitely couldn't appear for ninja turtles i was the one they called so who knows what is going on with me? I just say I wake up every morning. I never know what I'm going to do. I could be a voice of a dog, be a voice of a, a Muppet or whatever. So uh, that's the fun part of doing what I do. Mm. Lovely. Um, now, I'm a big fan of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It's one of my very favorite sitcoms. I love watching that show. And um, I was wondering if uh, you knew uh, James Avery from uh, when he did uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, because he was also Uncle Phil on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Hmm. Well, uh, I was aware of the show, but I think if anything, if he was at any of the uh, sessions of the six, seven sessions I was at, uh, I might have come across him, but we didn't uh, talk or any of that because we were there. I think back then uh, sessions took four hours or more and uh, oh. so these days uh, yeah uh but uh we we didn't have that much downtime to really uh relate and uh find out more uh, in between there we were there for the sessions and that's how i kind of looked at it okay that's why a lot of people don't even know that i did other voices uh for the uh, sound alike things uh occasionally I'll, I'll drop a line saying oh i heard this is going on well you know, I, you know fun fact is i did the voice of so and so for this or that and somebody said i didn't know that was you or i didn't know you were in there and there have been some projects that they don't even give credit to some of the voices like uh uh I don't know if they even uh, mentioned it in Monsters, Inc., the video game. Uh, there's a, a voice that Frank Oz used to do uh, in the film. And I fungus? Was fungus? Yes. And uh, he was more like uh, the worker in charge saying, okay, come on, everybody. Let's get together here. You know, and <laughs> talk to the fast pace. And uh, so they said they needed it for the video game because I guess he was 
tied up with other projects or on the East Coast and uh, wasn't going to fly him out to uh, be in L.A. where I'm based. So, uh, again, they said, well, we're going to hit that front switch uh, kind of for the Muppet stuff uh, like that. And uh, that's how they heard about me. Mm-hmm. And speaking of uh, Muppets, going back to uh, earlier, you were in the uh, Muppets film from 2011, uh, right? You did the voice of a stage manager, I think. Yeah, that was uh, so fun uh, for me because it felt like a, a little breakthrough to go from being a Muppet on in animation to actually being involved in a live action project. Mm-hmm. And uh, that I had auditioned for and then uh, they came in and said, okay, you'll be the voice that comes across the uh, speaker uh, right before they do their charity show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was the guy uh, counting down <laughs> for the show to start and uh, saying, uh, paging for Scooter or something like that. And I was like, isn't it a coincidence? I was Scooter and he was <laughs> being the show. Mm. But yeah, that that was yeah. I did, I do a lot of things like that, and as film uh, directors or whoever's in charge of uh, uh, casting little parts within the film that need voices that you don't see, uh, that I've been doing that since uh, early '80s uh, or so with uh, the TV show Chips and uh, the TV show Fame where they had crowd noises or individuals shouting various things out. Eventually, I also did that for The Simpsons for about 50 of their shows. Uh, They bring me in to be some of the background uh, characters that don't have names. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's another part of what you can do as voiceovers. Mm -hmm. You could be a singer in voiceovers. You could be a a sound-alike. With the background characters so that's that's basically my life what i love doing and uh, that's why i continue on i've been doing this about 39 years i realized <laughs> so i must be wow. doing something <laughs> and uh still people are finding out about me or fans might say you know i'm gonna be doing a uh, animated show of my own and uh, can't wait to have you in and do some characters for us so yeah it's a uh, one big uh circle of uh, entertainment of when it comes to voices that's what i like I, i'm still open to do on camera character work now uh, i've noticed a lot of the character people from when i was growing up aren't working as much and we we all have the same kind of uh, idea behind what's going on that there just wasn't uh, many funny films going on that needed silly characters and Mm. that kind of for film buffs that love comedy character work uh you you may have noticed mel brooks hasn't done uh any hysterical movies like he used to uh you know many of them have gone away and uh that's why a lot of the other character actors uh, felt that they weren't working as much because those uh, hysterical kind of projects aren't out there anymore mm, and yeah. last night i was watching a, a movie called the last song and that's that's a very serious kind of uh, film so yeah I, I totally understand what you're what you're talking about yeah we just don't have the like funny clean sense of uh, humor kind of things like the old uh, uh, uh police squad uh, or airplane uh, uh shows like that they're just plain silly and uh, yeah. So that's why I'm still doing voices and, and if something comes along, I'm available still. Well, I'll, I'll remember that. I'm, uh, I, I'm recently finished film school. I've got a work term coming up in a few days and uh, maybe one of these days, if I'm ever directing a film, I'll let you know if we need a background voice. Oh, yeah, whatever. I think, I, I haven't counted, uh, but I, I thought almost every film needs to be sweetened up here or there but uh yeah, unless it's like a, a two character uh, film uh but uh yeah they probably need that or else they have the actors do it themselves but uh you know it's all part of uh, the industry i'd say 
because you know uh, I've I've done a growling uh, a voice for uh, uh, was supposed to be a, a monster alligator. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Yeah, it was originally called the uh, uh, Leonard Cohen Untitled Project, but they changed the name. Uh, I think they turned it to something called highway or something like that but these guys sneak into a, a animal quarry of some sort and uh, there's a giant monster alligator there so they had me and two other people uh, uh do a mix of <laughs> this voracious growling and so things like that they uh, throw to me to come up with some some people don't know I do that, and other people I have to uh, tell them, hey, did you see that? Well, that was me. Uh, but that's why I like talking to people in movies and all that. I say, hey, if you need a, a voice for sound effects or you know, aliens or whatever, <laughs> so that's kind of what the business is. And I uh, always love talking about that. Well, I'll, I'll definitely keep you in mind. Um... Cool. So as I mentioned in the intro, uh, and as you were talking about uh, getting to know uh, Dawes Butler, uh, you uh, did Huckleberry Hound in Yo Yogi, which was a Hanna Barbera TV series. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, Huckleberry Hound was still a late back hound dog, but it was so in his teens apparently. Hi, and, Huckleberry. Uh, hey, howdy. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I even Huck got to... Huckleberry Hound's one of my favorite cartoon characters. Wow, great. Hey, you know, uh, yeah, he's still here, just kind of sitting around watching things go on and doing his own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, I still carry him with me. Uh, uh, fortunately, like you said, I studied with Dawes, so I picked up on some of his characters. Uh, and uh, the time came where he wasn't around. And they had the idea to make kind of like when Muppet Babies was the version, the young version of the Muppets. They were just like Warner Brother kids or whatever, Tiny Toons and uh, Disney kids and all that. So it was a time when they were doing cartoons of younger versions of established cartoons. So they said, okay, uh, let's take the Hanna-Barbera characters and make them teenagers and uh, working in a mall. So uh, they needed all the characters, and uh, I tried out for Huck and probably one other, but uh, uh, Greg Burson was doing Yogi at the time, and he also did the young Yogi, so they kept him. Because uh, I said, I could do Yogi too, if that's what you want. Uh, but uh, they uh, kept Greg as the young version as well, and Don Messick was there as Boo Boo. And uh, so, yeah, they put that cartoon together and they ran for about one season because shortly after that, they started running live programming uh, or uh, you know, uh, live filmed programs on Saturday mornings again. But I mm -hmm. think it's still running on some sort of uh, Warner Brother outlet uh, right now. And uh, yeah, it was just uh, incredible being able to, recreate the character uh, that my mentor Dawes Butler was uh, known for. Mm. There's uh, a... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying that. So that's the basis of the character uh, or the show. And yeah, it only ran one season, so that's why people didn't see more of it. Mm. It's really a shame that Huckleberry uh, doesn't get use that much uh there was a and we were talking uh, earlier about uh, the, uh you asking sesame street if you could do uh animated cartoons for them dawes butler actually did a few and there's one of them where he voiced a character who sounded almost identical to huckleberry hound <laughs> i remember uh well his voice is recognizable in some cases to me uh because i was also watching a series of cartoons that something called i guess merry melodies came out with yeah okay he was the narrator and the various characters throughout those uh they were based out of toledo i believe toledo ohio and uh one of the characters was called peppy possum and i remember in uh some of our workshops he would bring out a script 
and say, okay, you're going to be Pepe Possum, you'll be this and that. And I'm like wondering, well, how did he get this script? Well, apparently he either wrote it or he was uh, involved with that company that uh, came out with it. And uh, so he still had the scripts from that to practice off of. But yeah, he's he's been uh, heard here and there. I mean, I even heard Mel Blanc on an Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, uh, oh, really? Wow. Yeah. It was in... Uh, an episode where they brought back an old time uh, horror movie uh, uh, character that played Dracula or whatever, a vampire of some sort. And then they built him up to be like, hey, he's making a big return. And he, the, the character was feeling like, great, I'm back and all this. And then when they ran the film that they uh, brought him back in, it was Mel Blanc doing his voice and the audience would laugh and clap and, and then the actor felt really insulted. And I went, wait, that's Mel Blanc and Alfred Hitchcock. Wow. So those were the days when uh, the same people would be uh, thought of for, for doing uh, uh, some of those shows. Mm, a little animated piece from Sesame Street that Dawes was in. And if any of you listeners would like to see it, just click the corner of the YouTube video and uh, you can check it out. It's really funny. But I, I think he narrated it as, as well. And it was um, about a man who hated frogs. And the man's like, I hate frogs. It's a good thing. Oh, no, there's a frog right there. Go away. But what are all these flies doing here? And the frog <laughs> is eating the flies. And he doesn't realize, oh, okay, frogs eat the flies. So he apologizes to the frog, invites him to come back. And then the man learned to love frogs. I did not. I still hate frogs, but they're better than flies. Oh, I'm glad they use them. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, one of my yeah. very one of my very favorite little animated pieces from Sesame Street. I'm trying to think, I, I for some reason I think Mel Brooks even did a voice in one of their little cartoon uh, inserts. So, oh, yeah, they, they were doing some. Uh, sure, sounded like him, <laughs> and uh, must have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of when I was watching shows, I would say, I want to do something like that. I want to be the guy that you know, was in a cartoon saying something and eventually that came about mm -hmm. and uh, I've been loving it ever since. But I, I love anything comedy and uh, character -y and, and voicing because uh, I've been heard doing some serious things. I, once I did a documentary for somebody uh, about the Civil War uh, or something, and I had to play a text, and I gave him my Texas accent and said, "Yeah, I started in the war when I was a youngin, and then I came." And so, so I went on with the uh, uh, the character's speech, and afterwards, the producer of the project uh, said, "Oh, and what part of Texas are you from?" I said, "No, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, originally." <laughs> the director thought you were a Texan. I thought you were a Texan, and I said, "Oh." It's Part of the art of doing voices, and hopefully, you pick the right person. Oh, I mean, my God. that was a serious thing. Yeah, it was even serious. And, and that's another thing to me because when, when you study comedy and, and comedy acting, uh, that's hard for a lot of people. But to me, when I get thrown a serious part, I really dig into it. And uh, inside, I'm laughing though, saying, Oh, these people think I'm this or this. <laughs> and uh, adds to the character that I'm doing and uh, uh, so when I get the feedback uh, I mean uh, among other voices I've done that people probably uh, unless they gave me the credit for Oliver Stone did something called the history of the world uh, according to Oliver Stone or whatever and um, they needed somebody to recreate a speech that Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter gave or excerpts of a speech and so I tried out for Reagan and I tried out for Jimmy Carter and I know I could do Reagan because I did him in a play, uh, a comedy play at one point. And uh, so when I heard back, they said, they want you. And I was all set to do Reagan. They said, no, you'll be doing Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and I said, so my Georgian impression came off authentic enough. So. See, I, I just throw them out there. If they like them, great. And uh, if they're looking for a multi-voice, that's what I do. Cool. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you had a line in Toy Story, right? Uh, probably a couple. Okay. They gave me credit at the end to say I was in it. So at least people might 
uh, see it and say, oh, what did you do? So, okay. yeah. I, I, I feel yeah. like one of them was one of the Green Army men. One of them was. I, I couldn't even tell which one because sometimes people present me with a picture of one of the Army guys and uh, want me to autograph it for them because there was a main, I guess, commander and he recently died. He was well known. Everybody said, oh, we're going to miss him. But uh, the rest of us were the guys where he'd call out and say, you know, go ahead, soldiers. And then we're like, okay, here we are. Hey, you get that side, you get that side or whatever. And they were little incidental uh, lines through that part of the movie. So I can't remember what I did, but it was part of the crowd of the army guys that climbed out of the box at night. Uh, but then the most known uh, voice you can hear me clearly in were the doors to Pizza Planet when Buzz and Woody ran in from the gas station and I was so your so your line was you are clear to enter welcome to Pizza Planet. Uh, I I think all I said was uh, welcome to Pizza Planet. Uh, I don't know if I said more than that, but if I did, uh, I don't have any pictures to say. Okay, here's a pair of doors, and I'll sign them. Uh, <laughs> how do you you know do that? But uh, yeah, so I, I'm heard in there and uh, have signed some uh, autographs for people who. Toy Story fans, and mm. uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the that was the original Toy Story. Because the other ones, they've I believe uh, in the TV version or another movie version, Harry Shearer was a, a voice for the Doors. Uh, I'm because I, I don't know if they even remembered who did them originally, and so uh, uh, I was in the original movie doing it. Nice. So um, before we wrap up, uh, speaking of uh, film work, uh, you did uh, Transformers Dark of the Moon, which is uh, we were talking a little bit about um, serious type of films as opposed to uh, comedy. Uh, I, I won't really say that Transformers Dark of the Moon was serious, but it definitely wasn't, you know, like a slapstick kind of film. Uh, so how did, uh, can you talk a little bit about doing that movie? Uh, one, one thing I want to know is, um, Michael Bay was the director of the Transformers movies. Was he directing the voice sessions? He directed the voice session that I was in. And, okay. uh, so I was maybe a comic relief because, uh, uh, Igor was this little sphere like, uh, uh, pet of one of the Decepticons had maybe like four legs or six legs. And so more prominently in the scene where they're blowing up uh, the Lincoln Memorial in uh, Washington, D.C. And so uh, you, you can hear the one character calling to me saying, Igor, get over here. And I'm like, yes, master, yes, master. <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably other lines later on in the scene but uh, or in the movie. But yeah, uh, so I guess it was a little comic relief that he threw that in. Uh, that was the last time I worked with that particular project. And and just recently I heard, I think it was Robert Foxworth uh, went and directed that particular movie. And he, I heard that because uh, I, I looked him up because I saw him on a game show. And I said, I wonder what he did uh, since that game show. And I said, he directed Dark of the Moon. And I was... Uh, we we never got to meet. I I was at the session with Michael Bay, and mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Michael added whatever he, he he would say. Okay, and say this by the way, whatever it wasn't in the script. He just said, say this, and he might have left it in as uh, if they did any kind of outtake reel or something like that. But maybe he kept it all in the movie. But people would say, you remember when you said this? I said all I remember was him growling, uh, the you know, Igor growling. Uh, being the pet but uh yeah mm. sounded like, sounded uh, sounded a little bit like a uh, greg Berger's character grimlock oh really well uh greg many times i mean he has the, the lower voice than i do i have a mid to light voice and so when i think of the characters i do like if somebody would say hey can you come in and do my uh, michael clark duncan i'm like nowhere near him <laughs> <laughs> But I have been asked, I said, no, you got probably you're thinking of Greg Berger, but, uh, you know, uh, there are times I get those calls where they say, hey, can you 
do this or that. I Sometimes I'll pick up a voice and I just go, hey, I can do that voice. I remember uh, watching Lord of the Rings and when uh, Golub came out uh, in the theater, after he would talk and there'd be a, a quiet uh, uh, part of the movie, I would just go, I'm over here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and back then, nobody even knew somebody could sound like that uh, other than in the movie. And uh, since then, everybody else picked up on that voice too, where they, they say, oh, I don't know. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, there are people out there, kind of like when people doing Yoda too. After a while, everybody's saying, oh, I do Yoda, I do Yoda. So I kind of do some of the obscure voices that people might not do. <laughs> and then I get work from that as well. Mm. So, well, what are you working on right now? Any new projects that you can talk about? Uh, right now with everything being down, I mean, it's been since last year that I did anything. And uh, we are waiting for the release of a video game that I can't talk about until it comes out. So okay. it's a continuation of uh, an original and uh, I've been following it because they postponed it two years in a row now. So I'm waiting for that to come out. So then maybe the cons will have me in you know, helping to promote part of that. Uh, I have to even see if they kept the character because sometimes they over record and then say, well, let's cut this guy out or whatever. But uh they're just taking it a step at a time right now uh so when it comes out and if it does i will let, let everybody know <laughs> mm, awesome but, yeah, well so yeah you've got games you've got you know like i say anything that needs a voice i just love doing it and voices of talking checks in a bank commercial <laughs> where they're showing you how a check goes through its process and all that so mm. that's the fun life though in the, in the meantime, actually, when you say what, what else I'm doing, uh, uh, yeah, since everything's been locked down for so long, uh, most of the people working already had a show going on. So they're always coming back into however they're recording them. But it's a, a whole different process for right now. Uh, but on the side, I have a side hobby where I do transformational coaching. Oh, cool. Yeah. That is something that uh, people can use, but again, I'm not there to promote it unless I hear somebody say, you know, things aren't going well for me. And I said, well, what does you want to do? And then I uh, talk to them about it and they're on their way to uh, achieving whatever it is they want to achieve. I tell them I can show them the way because it's based on what I did to get to where I was at uh, doing what I want to do. And so I said, I got to share this with uh, the people that really want it. Um, a lot of people are out there. You could stop 10 people on the street and say, are you happy? Are you doing what you want to do? And, and maybe one would say they are. <laughs> and I said, that's why some people have uh, certain attitudes. And uh, if they had somebody there to tell them they can get better and do what they want to do, maybe that'll change. Yeah, you got to do it one at a time or else unless somebody puts a little group together for me to talk to about it, I can tell them. It's amazing. Well, Greg, thank you very much for uh, coming on Nostalgia Talk. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up? Uh, just that uh, happy to be part of the show. And uh, if anybody has any questions or any uh, inf information that they want to know about uh, animation, uh, you know, I'm... <laughs> I hope I covered some of that uh, information mm. for them. Well, I I, I think we've you know, you want to ask me. <laughs> I I think I think we've covered pretty much your entire career, basically. Well, for the most part. Well, it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I mean, it's it's you know a matter of uh, loving what you do and do what you love, and uh, you too can achieve amazing things it's a, I, I'm just so thrilled that I get to talk to people about what I've done and show them how they can do what they want to do because I went through that and I want people to be happy and go for their dreams lovely yeah when you wish upon a star makes no difference who you are I don't even I, I'm kind of stumbling on the rest of the words but but anyway to the listeners i will see you next time on nostalgia talk peace